child of Nancy Lee Ross and Graham Parsons. My father died when I was seven. I remember watching his death on the news. It was a pretty intense time for all of us. Throughout my entire life, I would end up battling many of the same demons that my father battled. Sometime in around 2001, I came to a point where I realized that it was absolutely mandatory to stop mourning my loss and complete the mourning of the death of my father. And I also knew that it was extremely important to step up into the shoes of my legacy as his publishing was reverting and uh, the responsibility of continuing and perpetuating his music started to come full circle. This concert really was a catalyst to um, one of the most intense years of my life. And lucky enough, as I lost one portion of my life, I gained something completely new. Her work continues with the proceeds of this show going to the Foundation Musicians Assistance Program. My new family, the Sin City All-Stars, Shiloh Morrow, and Bryson Jones, Dusty Wakeman, and uh, Johnny Kaplan. Johnny Kaplan, why am I forgetting his name, became my family. And um, they showed me who, who my father really was and how, how important his music and his legacy would be. I got my diesel wound up, so I'm running like never before. This trip gonna make it all right. I ain't seen a cop inside. Six days on the road, and I'm gonna make it home tonight. Johnny Cap. I got ten forward gears in a sweet Georgia overdrive. I'm taking little white pills, and my eyes are open wide. I just passed the Jimmy and a wife. By my side, as always, um, throughout my entire life, stood a, a woman that I admired more than anything in the world who I knew could help me to see this to completion. And her name was Shiloh Morrow. And here I sit with you today. <laughs> a couple of years later, can't believe that we're actually looking at, um, at the show that, that uh, you were able to dream up and that we were able to collectively assemble the right team of people. I don't think we really assembled them. I think they were assembled for us, but we just constantly walked through the doors together. Polly and I first met, um, we first met when we were three, actually, <laughs> because my mom was uh, going out with uh, the guitar tech for the Flying Burrito Brothers, and, and uh, so mom used to take me to go see uh, see the guys play and uh, you know we were the same age rolling around on the floor of the troubadour together little rock and roll babies it's amazing how our lives have come kind of full circle and we've had so many different relationships from from being toddlers to being you know goofy, crazy teenagers teenage <laughs> girls you know misfits. going to dance clubs and misfits and getting in all sorts of trouble and then I clearly went on to pursue a, a career and a path in the music business and I think that ultimately, you know, oftentimes we don't know what our path is going to be. We're just on this path or why we're doing what we're doing. But I think um, the 15 years that I spent with the Warner Music Group and all the label work and marketing work, that it was ultimately leading us to something greater. Right. And I think the timing was pretty wonderful that, uh, that we had started Sin City as the marketing company, focusing all on, on Roots Americana and country rock so that we could work with artists, you know. I just saw Jim Lauderdale flash up on the screen and I remembered working at WIA, mm -hmm. and that's how I met Jim Lauderdale, right. and how I met Susan Marshall, right. and through Jim meeting Dusty Wakeman and, right. and Bryson, and, and how that whole thing kind of came together. But here we are, and uh, there's a lot of people who we've known for a long time on this stage, and everybody really kind of made sense. Yeah. So watch the phone of me sitting here leaving They all damn I get in And Lord knows that New York City's got a lot to do with it I hope someday I can find a way to get it out of my brain This dirty old town's gonna sink right down
One of the really special parts of putting this tribute concert together was actually getting to go to Buddy and Carol Arnold, who were the co-founders, or the founders, actually, of the Musician's Assistance Program. I was able to go to them at a point in my life when I desperately needed help, and uh, they were there to help me. And uh, MAP was uh, created in 1992. I think I went to Buddy and Carol sometime in um, 2001, at the end of 2001. And unfortunately, I, well, fortunately, I got to sit with Buddy and Carol after being introduced to a young woman named Nicole Dion by one of my archangels, Bryson Jones, who said, you know, you two have to meet. And we met, and she said, have you ever thought about doing a concert, you know, for your father? And at that time, it just seemed absolutely impossible. And I knew that if, if anything was like, like that was to take place, that it was absolutely mandatory that, um, that all of the proceeds benefit something that made sense. And the Musician's Assistance Program fit that bill perfectly. Buddy and Carol kind of, you know, didn't know who I was, didn't know what, what I was up to, but we, they were more than loving and supportive. And we kept trudging along. And uh, later, later on, November of 2003, um, Buddy passed away. And uh, six months later, his wife, uh, I'm sure of a broken heart, followed him. So we were extremely fortunate that we were able to put the, this amazing group of musicians together to benefit other musicians getting sober and living their life and not losing more music the way that, you know, perhaps if my father had lived, if he had found a place like MAP, you know, if he might have still been here today. So Shyla and I felt really strongly about that. I mean, that's a, a big part of why, you know, Steve Earle, who's on the board of directors, actually, for MAP, and, uh, and John Doe and Lucinda, I mean, there was people, everybody really, it added to the night. It was a really important cause for everybody concerned. Yeah, it really was. And Lord knows that New York City's got a lot to do with it. You know, um, it was interesting you were talking about Nicole and about the concept of, you know, putting together the concert and through, um, I believe it was one of your roommate's friends, Julie Austin, yeah. um, was able to set up a meeting yeah. with Moss Jacobs from Nederlander. And I remember how nervous we were and how, how great it was. Well, you know, Moss Jacobs, I don't know, we'd grown up in the rock and roll world of Hollywood and, and Moss Jacobs was kind of like an iconic name. You know, he was He'd like- a golden voice. Golden voice. Punk and, rock promoter. And he was doing shows my entire life that I was going to and here, we got to go and, and have dinner with him and... It started out with a yellow legal pad with, with our treatment on it. You know, we didn't know anyone. We didn't know... And I, and we talk about this a lot, about how if we would have been professionals, if we would have been... We would have looked at this and realized it was impossible. It was an impossible feat. We probably wouldn't have done it just because we knew too much. But luckily, we didn't, we didn't know anything. We just had faith. So when we sat down with Moss, all we had was a legal pad and an idea. <laughs> yeah, we knew we knew Lucinda Williams, and we knew we could probably get, you know, probably. Tim Lauderdale, and we could probably get if all the stars aligned. <laughs> right. Thank God the stars aligned, but... Um, he loved it. He got it right away. Mm -hmm. He absolutely got it. Mm -hmm. That was, that was a, a real turning point for us when we realized that we were on the right path. Yeah, Moss was saying, too, it was like there's, you know... This was a passion project for right. him, and because uh, you know he knew that this wasn't going to be a big money payoff gig. No. I mean, everybody had to take care of their expenses, but um, and through his passion and commitment, and us going in every week and sitting with Moss, and then he talked to somebody else in his field who worked at a different company, and right. how we were able to kind of get both those you know House of Blues concerts when right. we met Lisa Giglio to right. like come in and collaborate on something. She heard about the project through the grapevine, and she was like, I gotta be a part of this, is what she told us, which was really cool. 
So all of a sudden, magically, doors started to open, and we just looked at each other and decided, well, you know, we're, we're, all we're going to do is wake up and walk through the next right door. And if the door slams in our face, then we'll back up and try something new. But until we get the universal, you know, message that this is not going to happen, we're just going to keep trudging along. So we did, which was really, really cool. Um, do you remember the initial wish list? I wish we had that notepad. I do. I have it. I have the initial wish, li wish list, which was uh, the Flaming Lips, Beck, Keith Richards, Willie Nelson, Emmy Lou Harris, Linda Ronstadt, Lucinda Williams, Ryan Adams, Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen. We were shooting for the stars here. <laughs> Elvis Costello, Tom Petty, Dwight Yoakam, Crosby, Stills and Nash, The Eagles, The Mavericks, Neil Young, Bonnie Raitt, Sheryl Crow, Bono. Oh, funny story, actually. Chris Hillman. Chris Hillman, absolutely. Um, Ben Harper, God, there's so many great stories. Right before we actually um, got started, one of the things that had happened was um, I was driving down the street. I was actually driving down Fountain Boulevard in Hollywood, and uh, or was it Fountain Avenue? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I'm driving along, and I'm listening to this amazing tribute album that Emmy Lou did to my dad, and um, and I'm I'm listening to uh, a track. Uh, called Juanita that Cheryl Crow did, I think. Mm -hmm. And as I'm driving, I look to my right, and on the corner is Cheryl Crow standing there with a the camera crew. And I went, "Wow, that is just crazy." And I was, and I kept driving, and I thought to myself, "Well, why don't you stop and say thank you? Why don't you stop and just reach out? I mean, the worst that can happen is she can just tell you to get lost." And so I pulled my car over and double parked and ran down the block and she was getting in her car and she was getting ready to leave. And I ran up to her and I was just like, hey, Cheryl, my name is Polly, I'm Graham's daughter. And I just want to say thank you for the work that you did on the tribute album because it was just amazing. And um, she was like, whoa, you're, I've, heard, I've heard about you, you're Graham. And I was just like, yeah. She's like, you gotta come down to the show we're doing tomorrow night in Santa Barbara and uh, check it out. And so we went, mm -hmm. you and I went. We brought her a t-shirt, a Grand Parsons and the Fallen Angels t-shirt that we got from a great, a great lady named Peggy who makes these great t-shirts. And, and we just thought, you know, I don't know what we thought, but I thought that was a pretty magical moment. And every single moment that led up to the concerts ended up being just like that. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of what you did, Polly, was you were able to show up and talk to people as a human being. It wasn't an agent or a manager or a record company person calling up each one of these artist managers or labels or agents. And you made a human connection and made a, just told them that you wanted to do a tribute to your dad and that you would love to, to have them be involved. And that's really kind of how the majority of the artists ended up on this stage. Dusty Wakeman was our musical director. You know, and he was amazing in coordinating, you know, everybody and getting everybody ready. And the, the core of the Sin City All-Stars had been doing tributes. Yesterday, it was a year to the day that we were in London right. doing our first in the middle big of, tribute. In the middle of making the tribute um, in Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, Shiloh and I decided to take on the endeavor of giving it a, a try in London to see if we could actually pull it off on a smaller scale. So and, we were actually doing both at the same time. And that, I mean... The UK was so, so important. There are so many amazing fans over there and nothing like that had really ever been done. Right. You know, we we fortunately, we have Graham Fest every year right. out in Joshua Tree. And even though it is, uh, it's on a, on a much smaller scale, I mean, it's really cool. And the fact that, you know, the Cosmic American Music Festival happens every year and these people kind of have, right. have kept the torch kind of going. We were just able to pull together some really large artists and put them on a much bigger stage. And that was really fun, just because I mean, honestly, I really didn't. I didn't even know a lot of the artists that played the London show, and Charlotte and I really didn't know much about the venue except for what we saw on the internet. We actually went on sale for the London show before we even had any we artists. We didn't have books. a lineup. We had no lineup, <laughs> and we went on sale in London. We and, sold uh, like 400 tickets without announcing a single artist. Thank God for Andy Stone, because yeah. he really pulled that whole thing. We had a liaison, Andy Stone, in London, who actually did all the work for us, which was absolutely phenomenal, because 
we really just put forward our, our ideas and he was able to tie them all together. But I think the coolest part of the London show was that it was done at a place called Union Chapel, was, which was a gigantic um, ancient Gothic church built in the 1900s or 1800s. 1700s. 1700s. And um, it, it was, the entire place was almost like it was in the round and we covered it in candlelight. I had just met this amazing singer named Susan Marshall through Shyla, who was a longtime friend of Shyla's. And I had just heard her sing at the tribute to dad in uh, Nashville. And she blew me away. I mean, she blew me away to the point where I was just, I was in tears. And when we decided to do the London show, it was mandatory, thank God, Shyla completely agreed to both of us that Susan be the common thread that tied everything together because just like dad loved rock and roll and loved country, he also was very, very tied to rhythm and blues. And uh, Susan Marshall was the epitome of a really amazing blues woman. Yeah, she's all those things because she's a rock chick too. And she right. sang with Primal Scream and she sang with, you know, the Afghan wigs. Right. And, and yeah, and she's got this amazing, you know, voice. And Do Right Woman just brings down the house every time. Right. God bless her. Right. God bless her for doing that. You may be the sweet and nice that won't keep you warm at night. But I'm the one who showed you Meeting Raul was really cool. Um, Shyla and I were actually doing the Grand Parsons tribute, I think, in, or were we doing South by Southwest? Yeah, it was South by Southwest where, you know, a lot of this whole time and putting this all together kind of circulated around the 30th anniversary of Graham's passing. Right. And um, with Sin City, we had gone to the Americana Music Association conference where um, we had put on a tribute to Graham and that year, he won the President's Award. Right. And we did a big show, and that actually fell on the 30th anniversary of his passing. It was so much fun, and it went over really well. A few months later, we were in Austin and decided to continue that as, like, our theme for our event was the, the tribute to Graham. Shyla and I got split up at some course during the night, and I was running around with my godmother, Pamela DeBar. We went to see the old 97s. We went to go see the old 97s. The Mavericks. And the Mavericks and Patty Griffith um, play at this huge outdoor venue. I think it was Stubbs. Stubbs. And uh, I, I was like standing there and I'm realizing, you know, God, these musicians and oh my God, Raul Malo just, he just makes me crazy. And I looked at my godmother and I said, all right, buddy, you're going to have to follow me because I'm going in. And she's like, what are you going to do? And I said, just follow me and stay close. And, uh, we snuck backstage, and when we got backstage, I knocked on one of the backstage doors and I asked to speak to Raul. And Eddie answered the door. Mm -hmm. Eddie Perez. There he is. <laughs> Eddie Perez answered the door and he said, "Who might you be, Madame?" And I said, "Well, um, my name is Polly, and I was wondering if I could meet Raul. I'm I'm a big fan." And uh, he said, "Sure, let me get him for you." And so. All of a sudden, you know, two seconds later, I'm standing in front of Raul Malo and I'm literally shaking. When you're in these moments, you've either got to stand up and just go for it, or you're going to jumble your words and everything's going to fall to pieces. From the experiences that we started out with, I realized that, you know, when you get yourself in these positions, you've got to come at it with an aspect of no fear. And so I just said straight out, Raul. We're gonna do this great tribute for my dad and I think it'd be fantastic if you came and if you'd like to join us, it'd be an honor to have you there. And he looked at me and he said, absolutely, which was just so amazing to me. That night I got to meet Rhett Miller from the old 97s. We had a really great time. He's a very, very dear friend of Pamela's. Unfortunately, their touring schedule didn't match up with being able to be at the concert, but boy, are they fun. Can you imagine of all the artists that we originally wrote down, had they turned up? We wanted to put on Woodstock. Yeah, basically. <laughs> like, Gra yeah, right. It's gonna be a three-day Gramstock. You know, Gramstock. And um, 
After that, we, we started coming home and Moss would put us in touch with people by saying, okay, well, we realized that up close and personal is the way to do this, is the way to ask artists to be a part of this because the phone calling really is not, it's not always the best way to go. You know, we really tried to, um, a few times we would meet every week and we tried to videotape some of these meetings because there were so many amazing things that happened you know, the running into Robbie Robertson in the elevator. Right. We were trying to make a documentary, you know, actually, of the whole making of, and I'm really glad that, that we, we did get to actually. talk about it and reflect now. Yeah. We did, we got a lot of really cool stuff. Right. We had so much fun. Like, I'm just, I look up at the screen and I think about what we were doing at this particular time. And, and it's hard because if you could see what's going on back there, right. and the, the frenzy and people hanging out. Jim James, we when we got all the nudie suits from the great girls, um, Nudie's granddaughter, Jamie Nudie, uh, brought her fabulous girlfriend down with a bunch of nudie suits. And, uh, we just made sure that they were there for the guys and you know everybody put one on and Jim James from My Morning Jacket put this peach nudie suit on and he looked like a pig in shit. He was so excited. <laughs> he was just so excited. It was mind blowing. The neat thing about the projections behind you, all the writing on uh, behind those projections are the treatment letters, the letters that I wrote to Keith asking Keith to be a part of the concert and letters to Emmy Lou and letters to Linda Ronstadt and you know the beauty of the aesthetic of the show really came to be because of a play called Taking the Jesus Pill by Charlie Terrell. When I saw his play he used projections and I knew at that moment that that's exactly how I wanted the aesthetic to be really rough and shadowy and he was able to really make that happen. Unfortunately, the first person he turned me on to, I couldn't afford. Charlie wasn't able to do it because he was too busy, and I didn't have enough money to pay this guy that he wanted to turn me on to, so I sold all my stock. <laughs> I sold, like, all the money in the world that I had, which was $6,000, to try to pay this guy, and he basically told me to get lost. So, lovingly, Charlie took the project on himself, and, man, am I lucky that he did. And then again, there's... <laughs> I know, you know, I wanted to talk about Charlie, though, because there's another person that was placed into my life 14 years ago because of my job. Totally catalyst. Because he's a renaissance man, and not only um, is he now a playwright, and is he an amazing graphic artist and visual artist, but he's an incredible musician, and... I got to meet him in 1990. I actually have a picture of the moment that we met, which is really cool at a convention. You guys look like hippies. Yeah. My little red-headed brother. Right. But it's really amazing that 14 years later, in a whole different context, Here comes we Charlie. were able to kind Charlie of... didn't even know. He taught himself how to edit on a Mac system because that's why he turned me on to someone else is because he's like, I'm not an editor. I don't know how to edit. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you're going to have to teach yourself. And he did. He did a damn fine job. Dusty Wakely came up with an idea to uh, make the song list a first come, first serve type of situation to be an incentive for people to sign up to get the music that they really wanted to do. I think everybody was really excited about the prospect of picking the songs that resonated with them most. And it was fun. It was kind of a fun process. It was fun. Sitting down, making a song list together yep. at the studio. We actually had to narrow it down because if it were up to us, we would have had 50 songs, right. you know? But clearly, in three hours, you can only fit so many, and there's a certain amount of artists and what have you. So we did up the, the Cosmic American Music Poll, posted it on the GrahamParsons.com website so people, you know, would definitely get to see the songs that they wanted to sing and then cast that out there to each artist kind of as they signed up. We didn't really have... A whole lot of conflicts. We were afraid that, you know, you're going to have five people wanting to do this Hickory Wind. Right. You know, and ultimately, you know, Keith walked in and wanted to do Hickory Wind, and that's that's how that works. Right. What happened was we didn't know if Keith was going to be able to make it or not, but we had to have the set list finished because we had to move forward with certain parts of the concert, but other parts of the concert were not moving forward. So I called Keith's people, and I said... Okay, I'm not asking for an answer, but, but if he was to show up, hypothetically to 
show up. Please ask him to tell me what songs he would. And we thought, oh my God, if we can somehow create the thread between Nora Jones and Al Jorgensen, then we've actually, we've really done something and can show that, that there is something really wonderful in this bond between people so diverse and genres so diverse and age and, groups. And, and that's when it became really important to us to make sure that this lineup was not typical, to make sure that this lineup was absolutely authentic and show and really gave the feeling of exactly that diversity mm -hmm. that was really really cool hey we were you know between the kings of leon and we, we got jim james from my morning jacket but we were looking at star sailor and i mean just the thrills the thrills absolutely ah. um, patrick we love patrick When did we go to the Stones concert? October of 2001? Mm-hmm. So October of 2001, it was Halloween. Yeah. And uh, Stones played at the Staples Center. Jeez. You know, it was right after, actually, we'd been in Joshua Tree and kind of, and you'd talked to Nicole about wanting to put together something, and we hadn't met Moss or anybody yet. Right. At that point. Right. And, um... Do you so, remember that feeling of driving down Fountain with those backstage passes and how we were bouncing around like little girls? I, I thought we'd died and gone to heaven. I know. Our friends at Hits, Mike Morrison. Yeah. A bunch of people who, like, tracked down Jane <laughs> Rose's number and got you in touch somehow um, so that we could go backstage. Yeah. And we t the traffic was so bad because it's L.A. and it's Halloween. Right that we right. <laughs> took the metro line right. down to the Staples Center right. with our passes and our tickets in hand. And got what was... I was actually, terrified. Talk about that. Like I was just terrified. I, so I didn't know what to wear. I remember thinking, you know, my God, you know, you're know, you going to meet Keith Richards. What in the world does one wear? And Waylon Will and Willie. Waylon and Willie. So I wore a T-shirt um, with Waylon and Willie on it. <laughs> it said on the bottom, together again. I didn't really know what I was going to do when I met this man, but um, I was really ho I was praying to God that they were you were going to be able to come with me. Well, it was chaotic, and I mean, again, Halloween, Rolling Stone show, Los Angeles, running around through 18 million layers of security, and Jane's dog dressed up. Right. I mean, she, yeah, it was she, Halloween. <laughs> All the wives of the Rolling Stones were dressed up like SWAT team cops, <laughs> in these little tight jumpers, and they were all hot, hot, it was hot. Great. It was fun. Oh, my God, it was great. So what would it, t tell me again what that was like, because I wasn't there with you, but um, They wouldn't what that let was like. you in. They wouldn't let you in, but we snuck a camera backstage, and we were so terrified to sneak the camera into the Staples Center because if they found it while we were at the door, we didn't have a car to put it into, and if you gave it to them, they don't fold it for you or whatever. We didn't know, but anyway. How did we sneak it in? Under my boob, of course. <laughs> Mama shy it's, secret weapon. That's baby. how we had to do it. So, anyways, the bummer part of this part right here, before we go any further, is that Shyla actually got to introduce me, and we weren't able to keep it there. There's Shyla and her beautiful and Dusty Big Daddy, Big Wigman. Daddy with us. Um, also, interesting, the rugs, the rugs on the floor from Dusty's studio. Thank yeah. you, Dusty, because we had no budget. His family. And this was me right here saying, get on your feet, people. How could you be sitting Tell, in, you know what, in actually, Santa Barbara? By the second song, everybody was on their feet screaming and clapping and yelling. And the Los Angeles crowd was so cool, you know, the, just the terminally unique hipster crowd. And everybody was very calm, and I was just like... 
dying. I'm like, how can you see? It's a whole it? different vibe though between the two venues. And I love the Universal Amphitheater, and I've been seeing shows there, you know, my whole life. But there's something really magical about Santa Barbara and being outside. And we clearly we shot this show here because it was a controlled environment, right? And, you know, and we had right. so much projected stuff. We couldn't really we couldn't shoot in Santa Barbara. But I was so glad that we'd been there for two days and that artists were able to, to get along. It was like summer camp right. at this point. And I would think that we were all so excited that maybe the audience just seemed... Right. Um, they were listening. They were really intent they on were. listening. And they were really hanging on every moment. And Everything and, started to get a little crazy at this point because the projector broke 20 minutes before the show started. I'm running around with a film crew chasing me around you know, with a fanny pack and I'm all mic'd up and I'm screaming and yelling at these wonderful people because I'm so stressed out and terrified that the projections aren't going to work because those were some of the most important things to me of this They had generator show. problems. It was beyond the projector just breaking, but right. we had weird generator problems. Right. And, so that's and we didn't have enough staff at the front, I guess, to take care of the onslaught of people that were trying to get in with the passes. So there was like a line a 30-minute line outside when the show started of people just trying to get into the venue that couldn't even get in. I think it was long enough. I know people who waited in line for over an hour. You know, I want to go back to something really quick. You just read this incredible speech. And um, one thing that I don't Marvin think really... Marvin Etzioni. Yeah, it's you, not on the DVD, but Marvin Etzioni, the mandolin player... Who's well, in Lone Justice. Who's in Lone who Justice. Who we worship. Who we worship, absolutely. He's called the punk rock mandolin player. Thank you very much. You'll see why later. Uh, when we were in Santa Barbara, I wasn't really sure. You know, I didn't have anything. Obviously, I had nothing prepared, but I knew I wanted to say thank you. And Marvin came to me the night before this show in Santa Barbara, and he said, Polly, I woke up in the middle of the night. I don't know why, but I wrote this down, and I thought you should have it. And... Uh, that ended up being verbatim what I read off of the page was what Marvin wrote the night before. Uh, really intense. Yeah, and you said that during the show, but I know that it didn't make like the whole cut. Like, so it was hard for people to understand when they're watching this. Like, yeah, these I aren't didn't really write Polly's. That. Those aren't my words. Right. But yeah. The sentiment was so. The sentiment was there. Incredible, and it was wonderful, and it was like he wrote something, and it came through him. It right. just came through him. He was just a vehicle for it. Absolutely. And, and that was really neat. Absolutely. Jed Hughes. Ooh. Yeah. Little guy. Little fabulous guy. Tonight, um, everybody, there's nobody on this stage that that, uh, that Graham Parsons isn't a huge part of why they're playing music, but I have another reason for being here, and we all do, and that's for Buddy Arnold, who founded MAP and has saved a lot of lives. And um, I met him uh, here in L.A. in front of a meeting several years ago. And, uh, he's... Uh, he was the real deal, and um, this is... Uh... Back to the Keith Richards story, which is quite intense. So there we are at the Staples Center, sneaking in cameras underneath Shiloh's boob so that we could hopefully get a picture with Keith. And uh, the time comes, and she says, okay, he's ready. What I didn't realize is as she's walking me down the hallway, Jane Rose, the fabulous Jane Rose, she says to me, no, he doesn't know you're here. This is a surprise. And I went... What? <laughs> oh, God. So uh, I walk into the backstage, and Keith and everybody has separate backstage areas, separate dressing rooms. And I walk in, and Keith and Ron are standing there talking. And he turns around, he looks at me, and Jane goes, Keith, this is Polly, Graham Parsons' daughter. And he goes, Oh my God. And he walks over and he puts his hands on my cheeks and he goes, you're the last little bit of your father on this planet. And I, of course, started crying. <laughs> right there, I just started crying. And um, he told me about how he and dad used to huddle together, you know, 
back in the party days when they were when they were coming down and they'd talk each other through it and they were just the best of pals and how much he loved my father and how he never expected in a million years that dad would go anywhere much less die and uh, I really didn't know what to do with myself I was kind of stunned as I suppose is normal to be in the face of Keith Richards and I turned around and I asked Ron Wood I said would you mind if I took a picture with you and he looked at me and he slugs Keith in the arm and he goes, she wants to take a picture with us. <laughs> As if it was like, not the most amazing thing in the world that I was getting to take a picture with them, but that it was actually kind of cool that, I don't know what that was, but it was pretty phenomenal. And uh, we took two pictures together and in the very first picture that we took together, um, Keith is smiling so big he looks like his face is going to crack. And I've never seen a picture of Keith Richards smiling. And um, that was a really magical night. And as I stood there with him right before I was getting ready to leave, I looked at him and I said, if I was ever able in a million years to put together a tribute for Dad, would you come be a part of it? And he looked at me and he said, if I did it for anyone, little girl, it would be for you. And then I said, you promise? And he said, I promise. And that was that. And I had to go for the next two years without talking to him on the faith that if we built it, he would come and he would stay true to his word. And, and he did. And he did. But we would never know again from that point if he would ever show up. Well, I mean, the, the Stones touring schedule, exactly. there was so much stuff that happened like from talking that to concert. The Pope. Well, yeah, but. They were on the road, and the tour kept getting extended, and the whole SARS outbreak happened, and oh, so they right. had to remake up dates. And so, and at the time, we were looking at doing this like October of the year before, and right. it was, I mean, just so much stuff that we just we wouldn't know. And right. Jane kept saying, you know what? Keep We've, doing what you're doing. And a month beforehand, we'll let you know if Keith's right. uh, I available. Can, I can let you know four weeks before the show. If he can be there, Polly, he will be there, and that's yep. all I can tell you. Yep. And so all we were left to do was to write handwritten letters as often as we could, just reminding them about what was going on and telling Keep. them about the progress we were making. Now, the truth is, is that behind the scenes, we were doing this without backing. We were doing this without any money at all, so we were terrified. And what you just saw right there was the room that Dad died in. That is room eight at the Joshua Tree Inn uh, where Daddy died. And uh, Charlie and I went up there with his brother, and we filmed that room for this song for Lucinda. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite songs of the entire show because as... Shyla and I were standing outside, jumping up and down, having such a great time. Lucinda comes walking down the hallway corridor like a quarterback going into the football stadium, and she's got her guitar slung on her back, and she's having at it, and we're just being silly, and she looks at both of us, and she goes, Missy's, I'm not in the mood. Yeah, we, well, we were having a good time. We had camera crews around right. us and everything else. Right. And she was having, a, like, a private moment, she kind was. of, like, getting ready to go she on was stage. Getting ready. And, and we were... Uh, we were we 16. Were, we were being 16 at prom, when right? We were 16. And she, she was being a professional, getting ready to do the do. Yeah. And there she goes, man, you know? I don't give it. The lighting director on this show was phenomenal. She was actually a Broadway lighting director that had not done a lot of concerts, but she had just finished doing Tom Waits. Okay, that's reason enough to hire her. But, um, of course, I couldn't afford her. Because she was such a big fan of Dad's, she actually put this beautiful, mystical, deep, rich lighting design together for this concert on a shoestring. And I am forever grateful to yeah. her for that. That glow. That glow. That glow. We wanted it to be in blues and reds and ambers and really raw and really organic and very unwashed out. It was really important. The yes. rest the rest of the song, I'm sorry, the rest of the song we shot at the King King, Charlie and I, uh, with two great friends of ours, Johnny Kaplan. That's on a song for you, which she oh. does next. Oh, right. This is, I think, Sleepless Nights. Right. And so that's all the desert stuff. Right, right, right. And then... Um, Charlie and his brother Brandon shot all of the footage that is on the DVD. They shot it all on their own. Different people helped us get different things, but this was all of us out there in the desert spending the night together, four of us and three of us in one bed mm. to get these shots. It was a magical time. James Burton. Wow. 
Uh, um, remember when we got James Burton, or we got to talk to him for the first time? Yeah, it was insane. I remember talking about when we were coming up with our wish list and saying to you, let's go beyond people who were influenced by Graham. And if we really want to tribute your dad, yeah. you know, like, who's still around that he would want to get. Yeah. And, you know, we called Buck. And Chris And we Etheridge. called George Jones. Yeah. But, like, those were his peers, like yeah. the Chris Etheridge crew. But right. I was talking about going back right. to who your dad was. Right, George Jones. I remember making the call and talking to his wife. And yeah. That was so cool. And she's like, honey, he doesn't tour anymore, but thanks He's for asking. No show Jones. Come yeah, on no now. show Jones. But finding James Burton was pretty incredible. And he came out, I think he was doing a session out at that studio in Calabasas. Right. And we, we Me got... Me and you and Bryson. Yep. Yeah. Oh. And how many great stories and talking about, like, uh, you know, I only played with uh, two songs. Viva Las Vegas and Ooh Las Vegas. Uh, yeah. You know, the whole the Elvis thing. And, and he's played with two Elvises between Costello and, of course, the king himself. So awesome. But he that was incredible. Was... And we another one of those people that wanted to do it and wanted to be there. And he tours so much with the Elvis project, the TCB thing, where they have Elvis up on the big screen. Right. And he's in Europe a lot. So less than a week before the show, we got a call from James right. Austin, actually, at Warner Brothers, saying that James Burton was trying to track us down, that he was available and wanted to come out. And at the very last minute, we're scrambling to try to get a plane ticket. We had no money. We're like, OK, but it's James Burton, and we got to get him here. So I'm like, I'll pick him up at the airport. I'll drive him there myself. And we were talking about chipping in together for his plane ticket. Yeah. And I, um, it was just touch and go, man. It really was. I don't know how any of this happened. I mean, literally, literally. Yeah. It was grand magic, is the phrase the that we kind phrase. of uh, had the entire time with us throughout this process when things like that would happen. It was, you know, we didn't really, we had to just not mess it up. Right. You know, we had to see that the doors were opening and walk through them, not be afraid to walk through them, and then... Um, the beginning was hilarious because there was such a naivete of at least myself. You know, we had this amazing guy, Bruce Rogers, who was this phenomenal set designer. And he comes to one of the meetings and he makes these amazing fabrications of this beautiful, beautiful set with these gigantic LCD screens and, you know, this big cross that's cut out with the blasting white light that the artists are going to walk through. and. It's a $35,000 screen on one side and a $35,000 screen on the other side. And we were going to have three. We were going to have three of these huge LCD screens made for the concert. And there was, I mean, it was just, just over the top. And then reality kicked in. The financial reality. Exactly. And we ended up with this beautiful 45-foot piece of muslin. That's how we do it. And you know what? <laughs> that was it. We wanted the shadows of the band members to play up against the light of the muslin, just like Charlie Terrell did in his play. Everything that you see here is a total ripoff of this brilliant guy, Charlie Terrell, which is great because, you know, it's the biggest form of flattery, right? Absolutely. Imitation. Imitation. Absolutely. So, anyways, the shoestring budget that we did it on a wing and a prayer and faith. And, and you know what? And look, check it out. It was pretty awesome. Jesus built a ship to sing a song to. right here this is when things really started to sink in and we realized you know what we're gonna make it Jim Lauderdale being the you know the MVP of the show man talk about most valuable player he would just fearlessly walk straight up to Keith Richards and go hey buddy you need some backup vocals 
Keith is like, sure, man. And then he, there's Jim singing with Keith, and there's Jim singing with Lucinda, and there's Jim, and there's Jim, and there's me in the background dancing. Actually, no, that's uh, Carla and Johnny looking like my mom and dad. And I was looking me. on stage for you just then, Polly. Really? I'm going, where are you hiding? Behind the drum kit? And I realized that you're talking about the montage. Oh, really? <laughs> I was like... Oh, I'm talking about the montage footage for this song. This song was written for my mom. A song for you was written for my mom. And the beautiful thing about this song was that my mom used to, you know, back in the day, the ladies would say, you know, hey, this is my old man. Be my old man. And my mom would say, this is my old boy, because he doesn't look like a man, and he's not. He's a boy, so this is my old boy. So that and was hot, so, hot burrito. Hot burrito number one, right. And so the line goes, I'm your toy, I'm your old boy. And then a song for you, I think, was written before or after, I'm not sure. But I wanted to have some representation of mom and dad together. So Carla, a friend of ours, played my mom, and Johnny played my dad. And uh, we all went to a big place called the King King, and we just turned on a boom box and turned on the disco ball. And Brandon and Charlie shot it in red light. And that was our montage for that song. It's pretty amazing. Johnny um, is getting quite a reputation for playing your father. Yeah, uh, I mean, he he's, he's, uh, <laughs> played Graham in the Alison Moore video. Trey Van and yet, yet another Absolutely. artist that we wanted it to have This on the guitar, bill. actually, um, Doug Pettibone is holding this fabulous guitar that I went running up to him at the Santa Barbara show, and we were having guitars signed by all the artists for charity. And I realized that in all the hustle and bustle, I never asked for anything for myself as a memento of this occasion of these shows. And I ran over to Doug Pettibone and I said, Doug, do you have a guitar that you don't need or that you could possibly let me have? <laughs> and he's like, sure, baby, take the red one. I'm like, okay. So I take the red one and I put it down and all the artists sign it. And uh, Doug had to play it for the next two nights and looked at me after the shows and said, you know, I'll make sure that you get this, but I need the pickup and the equipment off the guitar. I'll replace it with something else. But, you know, and so he gave me that beautiful guitar and it was all signed the night before this show in Santa Barbara. And that was really cool. Yeah, petty bone. Oh, boy. He really, sh he really shines, you know. Um, He's he was sick as a Luc dog this night. He mm -hmm. was so incredibly sick. The night before, he wore a great nudie suit, the big red one, but it was so heavy and so hot, and he had such a t high fever that um, I, I can't imagine that how he mustered a smile and how he didn't look like he was going to fall over. He, ha he was so incredibly ill at this show, at this night. Pull it off. Thanks, Dougie. Our first idea for the opening of the show was to have a, a New Orleans jazz band play at New Orleans Funeral March. The Dirty Dozen Brass Band was going to help us out with that. We were really excited about the idea of doing something like that because Shyla and I had just come home from New Orleans where we went to Daddy's gravesite. And uh, Daddy has a gravesite that's, you know, two by two. <laughs> nope, not even. It's probably nine inches in diameter. Um, the yeah. little marker, because yeah. that's all it is. It just says God's own singer. So he doesn't even have a tombstone in New Orleans. But I really wanted to show Shiloh where Daddy was buried in Louisiana. So he showed up there. It was uh, Jazz Fest, and Lou was uh, opening up for Bob Dylan. So and it turned out, because we'd just gone to Florida to go and meet the family, your dad's side of the family. Right, that and, was, and we decided Haven. that was really important to do while we were creating this concert, was to reach out and, and learn and uncover. We were like archeologists this whole time. We really were, it was like a dig. It mm -hmm. was like digging to find and what was real and what was not real. And in New Orleans, Shyla and I got to meet um, the family, Becky Gottsegan, who was Bob Parsons' daughter, who was daddy's stepdaughter. And she took us to the cemetery, and we walked in, and uh, the kind, kind funeral director, or the, the cemetery director, said, you know, can I help you? We actually started out in Winter Haven, Florida. At some point, Shyla and I went to Winter Haven, Florida, where we started to really, oh, God, do you remember this, going to the cemetery with all the Snivelys? 
I didn't want to lay flowers. Well, I did actually want to lay flowers, but they told me that they would die. So Shyla and I decided that we would lay peacock feathers <laughs> all over the grave sites of the Snively family. Oh, and nice, kind of conservative. Yeah, uh, and I think that they were probably rolling over in their graves at that point with two hippie children laying peacock feathers all over the <laughs> Snively graves. But, you know. That was a treat, and uh, I, <laughs> after we left Winter Haven, we went to New Orleans, and we got to meet Daddy's stepsister, Diana Gottsegan. And um, we went to the Louisiana Cemetery where Daddy's buried. Interestingly enough, it's just a few inches wide and a few inches long, a uh, placement stone type thing for Daddy's grave. There's no uh, gravestone. So one of my dreams, and one of the reasons we were there, was to find out how much it would cost to actually put a proper gravestone on Daddy's gravesite. And so we walked into the office, and the man looked at us, and he said, and how can I help you? And we said, well, you know, I'm Graham Parsons' daughter, and I was wondering if you could help me. And he said, my God, uh, you know, people come here from all over the world every year for the last 30 years and they leave your father the most beautiful elaborate things that I have to take away and collect into boxes because they can't be left out um, we, you know we clear away gifts from the grave sites you know I'd love to give you this box of these amazing things that these people leave for your dad and I was just like totally blown away. So we told him about the idea that we wanted to go ahead and make a bronze uh, plaque for dad and have maybe a gathering, you know, maybe put it out on the internet and allow people to come together and actually have a proper funeral for him. Just not even really a funeral, just a, a gathering of fans and friends and family. And he said, you know what would be really amazing? He said, you know, last week we had a bunch of gypsies <laughs> do a funeral right <clears throat> over here, do a, a jazz a, funeral a, procession. A jazz funeral procession with a big huge tent and gypsy dancers and they all had lunch together and they sat there all day. He said, you know, it'd be really amazing if you did a an old time funeral procession for your father, you know, an old jazz band and the black umbrellas and everything else. See, what do you what do you do next year? Exactly. That's what we, we gotta, we so now the plaque that. the plaque three years later, two years later is almost done. And uh, that'll be our next project, which is so exciting because uh, it's a lot of love went into that. But anyway did you ever get the box of stuff? Nope, never got the box of stuff. Mm -hmm. Never go got it. See that guy. Absolutely. Oh, do you remember Florida? Do you remember the crate? Oh no, yeah, I don't think we really want to really talk about Florida right now. Oof. We had some scary episodes go on in Florida trying to find my family. We had some really great episodes in Florida, but we had some very strange things happen to us while we were there. Obscure as his toil was in his, in his lifetime, he certainly, his legend has lived, and rightfully so, far beyond his years. And uh, I have the great honor and pleasure of doing this particular song tonight in, in this uh, tribute to Graham. So thank Polly for allowing me the pleasure of doing this. This old town is filled with sin. It is so wild. Wow. Dwight Yoakam, hmm. let's just, my God. I mean, the man did one of the most amazing renditions of Wheels and Sin City that I've ever heard. I, I, two of my f very favorite parts of the night were watching people do their own renditions of dad's songs and being fearless about doing their own copy, their own cover, their own rendition of their own interpretation of dad's music, which was such a treat for me. And that's what your dad did. Exactly. Because he did so many covers himself in his live sets where and he blended and, and did them in his own Graham way. Absolutely. Which is what's really cool. I think Graham would have dug this. I think he would have loved it. Absolutely would have loved it. And for the montage footage in the background, we actually went to Jamie Nudie's house and she let us borrow Nudie's old Cadillac covered in coins and horse uh, saddles and guns for door openers. And it was just the wackiest thing ever. It was so fabulous. And we filmed Johnny Kaplan in the car to be dad. And um, we just had the best time doing it. And. Uh, this entire video was edited by Sean Foster, this one part of the montage. And what we did is Shyla and I would give, uh, with Charlie, our art director, would give 
different young up-and-coming editors and directors raw footage that we had filmed at different parts of the year for different songs and we'd let each editor each up-and-coming editor or director do their own interpretation of that song. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, actually, pretty funny, but um, the guy that I took to my 11th grade prom, Frank Sacramento, ended up being a huge Graham Parsons fan, and he was a video director, and he did the one for She. Yeah, that's so right. So I forgot that there was yet another person from way back in our lives, These, all of these talented people that we know that, that came- That came forward. Have different backgrounds that came forward to kind of help this whole thing yeah, happen. yeah, yeah. You know? Keith Gaddis and Mitch Marine were part of the Sin City crew, and uh, Dwight came out and would see them play and liked him so much, he gathered them all together and took them out on the road with him, and and that was a really fun time. You know, Mitch used to play with the Lazy Stars, which is Johnny Kaplan's band, and Keith, a uh, guitar player, is a, an artist in his own right and plays around town a lot, and he's just a, an amazing songwriter and guitar player. It's pretty cool that... Um, He's getting to do both and to work with to work with Dwight. He's he, such a big fan of Dwight's. I actually got to meet Dwight. The way that Dwight ended up on this show is, <laughs> I was sitting in the living room one morning with my roommate uh, Rick Garcia, and I said, "You know what? I've got to start reaching out to people and just see what they say. They'll shoot me down if they don't want to do this. They'll just tell me to go away, or else the response, you know, let's find out what it is." So the first person I called about publishing because I really enjoyed his movies was Billy Bob Thornton. And the idea at that time was just to see if people were interested in using Dad's music in artistic films. And Billy Bob invited me over to his house one night, told me just to come in through the front door and go down the stairs to the basement. I thought, well, that's interesting. So I showed up at Billy Bob Thornton's house, and I went downstairs to the basement, and uh, lo and behold, there was Dwight Yoakam, Keith Gaddis, and Warren Zevon with Billy Bob Thornton actually recording the very last bit of music that Warren would ever record on the very last album before he passed. I got to see in between takes the authenticity and the trueness of an artist in Dwight Yoakam in his jeans, in his plaid shirt, with his guitar. It was so authentic and he was so amazing with nothing else going on that I was just drawn to him. I had always been drawn to Dwight as an artist, but I really, that night, gained respect for him and saw the admiration between the three of those men musically and uh, asked Dwight if he would do the concert. Not only was he a huge supporter of this project, but he, at this time, also, right before the concert, brought me onto his bus. He sat me down and um, he said, you know, I just want to talk to you for a second before this whole thing starts. And I want to tell you how proud I am of you and how proud your father is of you and how hard I know you've worked on this. I've been looking around for something that would mark this day for you from me. And it took me a long time to find it, but I finally found what I was looking for. And he handed me a little velveteen box with a tiny gold cross in it with diamonds encrusted that was exactly the same shape and diameter of the cross on my dad's jacket, the back of the nudie suit jacket that my dad's famous for. And uh, he gave me a card, and on the front of the card was uh, Sin City, and it was all the old signs in Las Vegas. And inside he said, you know, congratulations on a really beautiful night. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. And I think that he showed up, and the showmanship of Dwight at this moment was just absolutely bang on. and. I am forever indebted to his generosity and his kindness. Thank you all very much again for coming out tonight.
I'm gonna grow up and be the president of the Nora Jones fan club. Man, this little girl is a gem. She is such a treasure. She is so real as a young woman. And, you know, we had seen her in concert. She was very shy. And right about this time doing these concerts, we were so elevated in our excitement and we were having such a good time that I think we really, we drew her in and she got bubbly and fun and she just had such a great time. And, you know, I'm running around with these camera people following me and I run into her dressing room and I'm like, all right, baby, how you feeling? And she looked at me and she was reading a book with her little legs crossed and she said, I'm having the best time I've had since I was five years old. And I said, right on, you know. At the very last minute, we didn't know if this was ever going to happen, you know. You put it all in motion and you make the phone calls, but until they land on the tarmac of LAX, you don't know. Even, even once they land, no, no, no. you once, don't know. If, until, until we're all, you know, at <laughs> rehearsal. I mean, that was when it became real to me, when we all actually got to Santa Barbara and every artist actually turned up and made it. And it was oh. like, okay, they're not going to, the, the rug's not going to get pulled out from underneath this. Literally. We're, we're going. Literally. Fasten your seatbelts, kids. We're, we're going. She sure could say. On Nora's wrist during this time, Nora's wearing a wristband that we had made for all of the artists by a, a wonderful designer. Susan. Susan, yeah. She made these amazing leather wristbands for everybody, and to this day... Susan you... Baltazar? No, uh, Baltazar is the great guy that made all the guitar straps oh, for everybody. Goose. Yeah. Right. They're um, not wearing them here. We gave them to him after the show. Yeah, but... yeah. But they're wearing them now, which is There's so that cool. wristband. There's that wristband. Nora still wears that wristband to this day. And she, you just went and saw her, and she's, yeah. uh, she closes the show now with Ooh Las Vegas, yeah. and she still does She. And, yeah. yeah. And she does Ooh Las Vegas just the way we did it at the show, when it was just a big party, and everybody, and she's dancing, and the, she gets the whole audience. This, she uses Ooh Las Vegas as her last encore song now on her tour. And she gets everybody up on their feet screaming and dancing and clapping over their heads during that thing. And it was so fun to see her blossom and come out of that shell, you know, and just, just go for it. No she, fear. She's she just gets awesome. it. She wants to relive the magic. Yeah. She's taking it with her. She really gets it, man. The footage behind her is, uh, it's Alabama where Charlie and Brandon were from. It was footage that they shot years ago. So a little bit of magic from everyone in our lives to bring everything together is, it's just so crazy. <laughs> so crazy. I'm still looking, you know, at Al Perkins and thinking Al Perkins and James Burton had played together these songs, you know, in, in years. 30 years. Right. And they really didn't have much rehearsal together. The core of the group of the Sin City All-Stars actually rehearsed for a couple of days before going to Santa Barbara. But with James coming in at the last minute, right. it, he and Al didn't really see each other and start playing these licks together until one day before the Santa Barbara show. Right. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. And I have so much respect. Al Perkins played on Exile on Main Street. For God's sakes. You know? Right. Oh, God. And, and James has played with any, everybody under the sun. But it's amazing when, you know, the look on Keith's face when Keith saw James Burton and he was so excited that he was there and he's like, good, because then he could sit back and have fun. Right. Because he knew that, you know, James was going to be there picking it up. Right. It's pretty awesome. She worked in she slept so hard A big old field was her backyard In the Delta sun She so could say oh, 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 she so could say My, 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 but she so could say You know what I just realized? Hmm. I got Daddy's stepsister's name wrong. It's not Diana Gottsegan, it's Becky Gottsegan. You said Diana? Yeah, Diana was Daddy's real sister. Oh my gosh. Looks just like him. We were rolling through. Just like him. I think she came to the Universal Amphitheater show Daddy's sister did. 
Yeah, and I, and I never met her. There were so many. It was so insane, actually, afterwards and during intermission That's that crazy. it is a big blur to me. And I'm so, I'm so happy that we were able to actually record these nights or else I would never have actually been able to see the show. That's so true. And we didn't know that the shows were going to be able to be recorded until a week before the show. Yeah. So We had no idea. We were willing, literally, when they came to us and they said, you know, we're going to have to pull the plug. We said, okay. You know? Two days before the show, I got a phone call from Keith Richards' camp saying, I'm sorry, he can't come. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I have no control over this. It's going to happen or it's not going to happen. Oh. And Shyla and I looked at each other and said, you know what? God didn't bring us this far to drop us on our heads now. Yeah. We can do this. And that's literally what we said to each other in the kitchen. Yeah. It was pretty insane. That was pretty intense. I would say, you know. That was the most intense moment was three days before the show when we had everything done and then all of a sudden everything started to unravel. We had to find a plane for Keith. And we had to find a plane donated. Well, and it, the it, plane had to be a specific plane. It couldn't be a regular private plane. It had to be a private plane that was large enough for him to stand and walk in. And it, it had to be a certain kind. Well, by the way, this is what we talked about, being naive. Yeah. If anybody else would actually know, well, of course, of course Keith Richards, Richards doesn't travel in commercial airway. Commercial airway, right? right? But it never no. occurred to us, didn't dawn on us. that we were going to have to find a plane for Keith. So and we did. so we're at the, you know, the very end, you know, by the way, try to rent a plane these days but privately. It's not cheap. And we right. didn't have any money. So we knew that Hundreds we had to go. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. And literally, I mean, how funny it is to be on the phone trying to find out how much it is to rent a plane to pick up Keith Richards from New York or whatever, right? By the way, and they're, la the, they're laughing the day at that, me. The day that we did that, I got a boot on my car. Right. Right, because now I have, she can't drive. Can't, pay, I'm not paying my parking tickets. Oh, but we're yet. both broke. Literally, <laughs> at this point, we don't have a dime between us. All of my credit cards are maxed for everything. I mean, literally. Parents, mom, Parents mom and dad are us out. I was on unemployment for six months before the show. I've sold all my life savings, all my bonds, all my stocks, all my everything's gone. So, but somehow we're gonna we rent can, a plane no, for no, Keith. No. We find it. We we actually get planes donated. We do, and this amazing guy from Lucky Brand Jeans, Gene Montesano, and I have to say thank you so much to him because now this was my fault, and I have to apologize for this. Gene offered his plane to us through Moss Jacobs. I believe. Mm -hmm. He lives in Santa Barbara, and he was psyched that we were going to bring a show of this caliber to the community. And so he, you know, was willing to let us use the plane to make it happen. However. Again. However. However, he was being kind enough to pick up Keith and bring him to Santa Barbara because he was going from one place to another as well, so he would be on the plane. Well, that's not okay, and I didn't know that. I figured, well, you know, gosh, it's his plane. You know, it's a huge thing. One person will be in the front, one person will be in the back, no big deal. Well, for security reasons, that's not allowed. And. Uh, I honestly had no idea. And so two days before Keith is getting ready to get on the plane, I get a phone call saying, it's not gonna happen. Security reasons, we can't allow this to happen. So we're very sorry, but you're gonna have to go ahead and prepare a press release that's gonna go ahead and explain to the world that Keith Richards won't be there. But look, he's there. <laughs> because because Uncle Keith comes through in the end and God bless we, Jane Rose and Keith's crew and Keith's people and you well, know. Well, you know what? That's look at the daddy's guitar strap. That was remember the Willie Nelson show? I walked into the Willie Nelson show and I got to meet Willie Nelson. I almost died. <laughs> he's like literally, he's like God. He looks and feels when you stand next to him like he's a fully realized man. This was the last time I was going to see Keith. It was the first time I had seen him since we saw him in 2001 at and Staples. Was, and it was like two months before the show, maybe. And, you said like in May? June. It was in June? I think so. It was in two months. It was like four weeks, I think. Maybe it was two months. And I walked in and the only thing I own of my father's is his guitar strap. 
and I knew that the last time I saw Keith, I needed him to understand the weight and the depth of the request I was making. And I figured if anybody should have Daddy's guitar strap, it should be Keith. So I gave it to Keith and begged him not to lose it. <laughs> and there it is. I want authenticities in the room. Hmm? And one want authenticities in the room. People know it. People know it. That's so true. I think we looked at each other at this point and started crying. <laughs> Said we did it. I always pretend. picture that ended up being up on the screen during this song was really special because Charlie Terrell, the once again, the infamous <laughs> Charlie Terrell, dug this out of a book the night before this show. It wasn't used in the show the night before. It came to him in a split second, and he put it up there, and nobody knew it was going up there. Not Keith, not me. Pretty not amazing. Shira. Nobody knew. And I didn't even realize having not seen the show from front of stage the night before. I was always on the side or getting things from backstage. I didn't realize that that wasn't up because the first time that I'd walked to the front of the stage right. to see anything was the second night. Right. So I didn't know that that hadn't been up there the night before. Right. Mom tried to get to the show and she couldn't make it because there was an accident on the freeway. That was a real bummer. But she did get to see the show the night before, which we did. De I dedicated that show to my mother because, uh, you know, she was a big part of the music for me and I know for my father. But what a moment this was. <sighs> so intense. My blessings bless you. I love looking at Bryson right here, and he says, what in the world did we just see? It's just my favorite, favorite. He's just like, whoa. One of the things that was really important to me was to bring a, together a gospel choir because of the element of rhythm and blues and gospel that Daddy loves so much. Didn't have any money for a choir. Wasn't sure how we were gonna get one, but uh, luckily we had Susan Marshall and we had Faith and the House of Blues Gospel Choir came together at the very last minute. At first they told us that only 10 members would be able to do it on each night. Yeah, and then they went to rehearsal at Mad Dog Studios a couple days before Santa Barbara. And suddenly the tune changed and it was 20 for both nights. I think we were gonna be able to only have like maybe 10, a smaller choir in, um, Santa Barbara, and then a bigger one at Universal. Right. I think that's because, and it was because of the drive, and you know, trying to bus everybody up there, and you know, it's kind of a little bit of a trek, and and again, because of artists really vibing off of each other and really feeling connected to it, and everyone's like, nope, we're in, we're going, we're doing both shows. Right. I know that for Susan. Susan's like one of our sisters. We talked about this. She cried. Yeah. That first rehearsal and doing this, you know, she'd worked out with Dusty trying to come up with an arrangement. She had done recordings of it in Memphis and said it to us, like, you know, how they could arrange this song and how it would build. And um, we couldn't hear it, you and I, at the very beginning. Yeah, it was. It we was. Had, we just didn't get it. I wasn't first. sure how it was going to actually turn out. We thought, well, maybe we shouldn't do a choir. Maybe we should just do just a few people, some of the other artists. We knew we wanted the song in there, but I mean, it was unbelievable when they actually sit there and work this out and Susan singing with these guys. It was, this was a real magical moment. It was a great moment. You know, I think uh, a lot of people came to us afterwards. And it's great too, because if you look around in the back and you see James Burton, you see, 
you know, Lauderdale, you see Keith, Keith playing with the band. And he, you know, just a few seconds before we went on that night, I was thinking that I wanted to switch things up and put the gospel choir before Keith and have Keith close the show. And when I went to Keith... You went and talked to a couple people about this. I you did. went and talked to a couple artists about this. I went and I decided, you know, I need some guidance on this issue. I can't make this decision by myself. So I went to John Doe and I went to Steve Earle, I think. And then I went to Keith. And the consensus was nobody follows a gospel choir. Unless it's a grand finale, but no single person follows a gospel choir, Polly. Yeah. And so there it was, and that was the consensus. And Sylvia St. James, who was the head of the gospel, brought everyone together. She was such a gigantic motivator. She was such an advocate and a just would not let this thing fail, period. And it was just touch and go for a long time because she was busy around the world and nobody could reach her. And I knew it needed to happen. I just didn't know how. And... Uh, Keith had such a blast. He was just <laughs> jamming with the boys and the boys. It was such a heavenly moment. It was just nutty. You know, I never got a final count as to how many bodies actually walked across the stage that night. If you think about just how many different musicians, right. and how many, you know what I mean? Right. Well, there's 20 in the gospel choir alone. Right. So there had to have been at least, you know, pushing 50, 75 artists. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a lot of people to coordinate and to make sure everybody's where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there. To and how to get the choir there was just crazy, trying to get them to Santa Barbara. They were all in different cars. They were all coming after work. <laughs> they all did this for not a dime. God bless them all. I, I just, I don't even know. I just don't know how any of this actually happened. I really don't. I'll we'll say it again. Graham magic. Oh, God, it's crazy, though, to look at it and just think, how in the world did we do this? It just doesn't make any sense. You know who would have had such a great time? It would have been Linda Ronstadt. I remember when I first called her up, and I spoke to Janet Stark, her assistant, and I told her what we were up to, and she was just like, oh my God, Linda's gonna love this, you know? She'd really, really dig doing this, and and uh, the idea was is that we would document whoever couldn't be there in person. Um, we would sit down and talk to them as a portion of a documentary about the making of the concert. Maybe someday we'll still do that. That'd yeah, be really cool. It was pretty neat, you know. I like this. I like the fact that we can talk about it now, because at the time that was never, you know, really an option. So somehow, yet again, we wanted to be able to kind of tell stories about how things kind of came about and, and all the interesting parts, and we didn't think it was going to happen. Two of the first people that we wanted to approach were Beck and Ben Harper, and mm -hmm. there's some really interesting stories behind that. Ben Harper was playing at the Santa Barbara County Bowl. Moss Jacobs got me in to meet Ben after one of his shows, and Bryson came with me. After Ben was done with his show, he was brought backstage, and they introduced us. And uh, he got so excited and so touched that we were talking about the subject matter that we were talking about that he dragged me down the hallway to his clothing trunks and he said you've got to see my collection of nudie suits you've got to see i'm gonna do these concerts and i can't sh wait to show you what i'm gonna wear and he opened up these clothing trunks and out came this sparkling rhinestone nudie suits that he collected you know for years and years and years because he was such a big fan of dad's that was a really big treat i think the other fun thing was that when we finally I snuck backstage actually literally snuck backstage at a Beck concert and much to the chagrin of many many people because I was not supposed to be doing what I was doing I got to talk to Beck and uh, he was a really really wonderful person and um, definitely would have done the concerts but he was getting ready to have a little baby and then Ryan Adams Ryan's a great friend and he would have 
and great. And he had a broken hand. Broken hand. It's easy to do. I'm sorry, I'm kind of, I'm lost and I'm looking at this going, okay, we're all standing on stage singing Wild Horses with Keith Richards. Let's talk about that for a second. How crazy is that? <laughs> I couldn't believe that this was ending now. Like, I remember thinking, this can't, actually, you know what I was thinking? I was thinking, I just spun around this stage in front of 3,000 people without any panties on. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I don't think that's happened yet. So what the good thing is, is now we can look forward to that. Because oh, I think it's great, in the end. Great, 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 great. Yeah. Now everybody can look. Hey, good. See how yeah, you are? Yeah, good. See how you are? Giving them the heads up. <laughs> Why you got to do it like that? See? I want you suffer. I love the phone calls that we got from Jim Lauderdale after the show. He just called and thanked us, thanked us, and thanked us. He had such a good time. Well, again, we talk about the spirit and energy and an intent behind doing something, and because it was such a fun environment for everybody. And there's, I was just thinking, um, our friend Kat Maslitch, who's saying, and the fact that her baby got to be on stage because yeah. she's pregnant. Yeah. And, uh... And little sisters that showed up and, you know, just in time to, I mean, family and friends and people loving us through this process, and reminding us every step of the way, you can do it, you can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's another 20 bucks. Don't give up. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, wow. So we were gonna have that New Orleans jazz band start off this show in a funeral procession. You know, I think so many times there were so many great ideas, but had everything had it panned out, it just would have been a circus. I know, I mean, which, which is part of the fun, but it really ended up being exactly what it was supposed to be. Because everything happens the way it's supposed to happen or else it would have happened differently. There we go. That's kind of a... It's one of our mottos. <laughs> I wanted to say I love you so much this night. I didn't know how to do it, so I used the I love you sign as my, as my transmitter of what I was feeling <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I thought you were flashing the metal horns. No, I love you. Oh, that love whole time you. I was like, what, Polly just turned into some raging metal chick this no. whole time. <laughs> That's sign language for I love you. <laughs> I'm yeah. too much of a rocker. Yeah, you I've are. Got, I've got my old rock pass. You passing. really thought that's what I was doing I, this I whole could, time? Yes. The whole, every time I watch it, I go, I don't understand why Polly's Jesus. flipping the, the, the metal horns. Rock on! Enjoy the rest of the show. Welcome yeah. to Return to it's Sin City. <laughs> Party on, dude. No. See, well, I'm, see, I'm glad. We're learning so much. I got so pissed off at Johnny Kaplan right around here. Oh, look at me. What am I doing? We're not supposed to say that. Oops. Look at the, oh, what a great time. I can't look at it because I'll just comment. Well, this is heaven. This is the epitome of heaven. This is everything that every little girl in the entire world has ever dreamt of happening all at once. Right there, It's what's great is that I feel like your dad was sitting on Dave Raven's shoulder. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Dave Raven was playing drums, and um, and I just feel like Graham was sitting around, just kind of watching and, and being there. I think it that felt... when you when you have that many people in a room concentrating solely on one thing intentionally, mm -hmm. that you can't help but draw it to you. Mm -hmm. I really think that's what happened. I 
I was crying right here so hard. But we did it. Who would have thought? What an angel. Keith. God, I hope he loved this. I hope he had, I hope he had a great time. I don't think that that is a question. I mean, just by everything. He just yeah. kissed me. He did. And that was really important for me to just, I wanted everybody to just feel how important it is to come together for things that are just so real. Oh, what a night. Don't forget who we are. Amen. God bless. And thank you for being a part of a really, really deep little girl's dream. Good night. Here she goes. Whoopsie! That's when she realizes, I need to stop that. This is the part, I think it was Leo or somebody said, this is the part where we call Party with Polly. Party with Polly. Because at this, at this point. At this point, it was just a big rage. People who are in production, I remember, you know, Shell came up on stage and Lisa Giglio. <laughs> Patty O'Neill, God bless her heart. And Versa Vers Monos. You know, Versa was my psychic. Versa, who ended up being our publicist, who did some of the most amazing work I've ever seen in my life on any project, was my psychic before she was my publicist for this show. Yeah, and didn't know who your dad was. You hadn't told she didn't, her. I hadn't told her who my dad was during our session. She was. I was turned on to her by Julie, who was working with John Mellencamp at the time, and said, this lady's a great psychic, you should go see her. And I asked her, you know, what do you think I should do about this stuff? And she goes, whatever you're working on right now is really important and you need to do it. And she said, for God's sakes, who is your father? And I said, Graham Parsons. And she said, honey, I used to work as his A&R person. Uh, and his publicist, his publicist at a and A&M. A &M. Yeah. And she said, you've got to do this. You've got to do it. It's going to happen, and it's going to be fine. Just don't give up. The great thing was is we were going to need a publicist. And you know, Versa came to sit in one day and just assumed the role. Yep. And it was, again, we, we talk about all these people from yeah. different parts of our lives who just came and showed up with their talent. And their intention. And their Patty O'Neill. Patty O'Neill wanted to be a part of this. She was our tour designer, the person that put our tour director. And she did such an immaculate job, but she just wanted to be a part of the project. She had no ulterior motives at all. She refused to be even financially compensated. She just wanted to be a part of the project. In the end, we were, we were able to take care of her, thank God. And she did such a great job. Everybody did such an amazing job. <laughs> and they had so much fun. I do have to say that this is pretty funny. At, in Santa Barbara, everybody was out front dancing during this part. So John and, and Jim James are sitting there together now, and like looking around, like where's everybody else? Yeah, yeah. Two of them out there exactly. dancing. Exactly. Like everyone on stage was flooded into the center of the stage dancing in Santa Barbara. So I guess we got nervous on this one. There you are, Shy. Yeah, pretty blue. There I am. And I'm there with Kathleen Edwards, and now her husband, Colin, because they got married after the show. You know, I didn't even know Kathleen's music when we first started out. Lisa Giglio from House of Blues was really a strong supporter of Kathleen being one of the newcomers on the show. And um, I didn't know, I wasn't familiar with her music, and I'm really glad that that ended up working out, you know? Yeah. Because what a great addition she was. All the footage was shot by the boys in Las Vegas on a renegade guerrilla style type situation. We promised ourselves that no matter what, even if we couldn't 
afford to film this show that we would do it with handheld camcorders if mm -hmm. we had to. There's our little Lisa, Lisa Ash. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for loving us enough to walk through this amazing journey with us. We will be forever thankful. Mm -hmm. And Daddy, we love you. <laughs>